Hi, my name is Nina Menkes. I'm producer and director of Brainwash Sex Camera Power, which is showing in the panorama section. And it is a film about uh, 120 years of the male gaze on our backs. And I hope you come see it and help join the movement to throw the male gaze off our backs and into the garbage. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the 36th Teddy Award. My name is Jan Felix Wuttig and today I'm here in the beautiful Teddy studio at Meyers Hotel in Berlin and I'm going to talk with director Nina Menkes about her film Brainwashed Sex Camera Power. Welcome Nina, pleased to have you here. Hey, thank you. Okay. I'm so excited yeah. to... I'm going to be in Berlin next week. I can't believe it. Show the film. Right. Very exciting. Yeah, we're very excited to have you. Um, and thank you so much again for, for the film. I found it was a very captivating film and it, it felt like a sort of definite and, and um, 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 very comprehensible take on, on the way that the male gaze sort of in, informs uh, the, um, the ways that, that um, the female body, but also power dynamics and, and social perceptions of, of bodies are, are shaped in, in society. Um, it's a film about how uh, patriarchal practices in film and the film industry sort of shape that, that sort of understanding and, and also the, the male-female dynamic. Um, and you've been a prolific filmmaker for the past 40 years um, and you've also kind of worked kind of disrupting that ubiquitousness of the male gaze through your own work. Um, could you maybe tell us what made you take on that topic in such a way as you have with Brainwashed? Yeah, it was, you know, as you mentioned, I've been making films for a long time and my films, um, you know, without reading film theory or anything from from a young age i just picked up a camera and i shot women in a very very different way um than what i had seen around me um and so when i became um when i started teaching which i should mention is uh something that i never planned to do you know i just wanted to be a filmmaker but I hit the glass ceiling that we talk about in the film that everybody knows about, where, uh, you know, women directors just couldn't catch a break for many reasons. Um, one of them being uh, that <laughs> if you don't reproduce the kind of tropes that are embedded into the male gaze uh, way of looking, um, you're, you're just, you know, seen as an outsider, mm -hmm. you know? which of course I was, but anyway, the point being that I started to teach to basically pay my rent. Yeah. Um, can I ask though a favor? I'm seeing a huge picture of myself and it's really hard for me to oh, yeah. talk. Um, can, can I not see my... Is there, is there some way we can... Okay, that, yeah, that's at least, at least it's not giant. <laughs> okay. yeah. Are you going to edit yeah. this by the way, or did I ruin it now? No, 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 no it's fine. Um, we 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 okay. well we're we're cutting it live, but that's that's no problem at all. Um, okay. okay. So anyway, so I was saying that I you know as a way as a way to survive, I started teaching. Um, I had never really intended or wanted to be a teacher, but I fell into it as as a way to to survive and pay my rent. Mm -hmm. And I started. Um, realizing that a good way to kind of explain things to my students um, would be to take film clips from different films that we see around us and from film history and like point out some points that I had noticed about shot design. Of course, I was influenced by Laura Mulvey and other mm -hmm. uh, important theorists in doing that, but you know, it was specifically about shot design. Um, and that, that was something that I just did you know, usually like once a semester for my students um, on a regular basis. And I never uh, thought of it uh, as as more than that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but to make a long story short, um, when the when the Me Too movement hit with the uh, Harvey Weinstein um, 
expose in the New York Times in October 2017, I sort of thought like, you know, I'm going to write a little essay about this, how this whole story with Harvey Weinstein is actually intimately connected with the language of film and with the way that women are uh, perceived and constructed to be sexual objects. And furthermore, it's connected to the fact that women can't catch a break um, as filmmakers, especially as I think it's much better in Europe, but it's you know been terrible in the United States. Um, and I wrote this article for Filmmaker Magazine and the article went viral mm -hmm. and it was their most popular article. It was suddenly like people wanted to hear more about it and I was invited to give my talk um, all over the place, you know, many important film festivals and schools. And in fact, um, the DFFB had invited me before that. It was in 2017, yeah. March, before the um, this uh, essay that I wrote. Uh, to give a presentation and I gave a version of that presentation in Berlin. That was the very first presentation I ever gave outside of a classroom context and people were, were really excited about it. So everywhere I gave the talk, I was like mobbed by people saying, <laughs> oh my God, you know, you should make this into a film because everyone needs to see it. So it, and the pressure really came from outside people basically asking for the film. Um, and uh, that's that was the genesis. So never thought of making a film about it, never wanted to be in front of the camera. I can tell you that was <laughs> not, not something I ever aspired to be, but uh, it sort of just happened. Yeah, but I think also um, everybody should see it. I mean, like I said, it, it is such a such a very poignant and, and um, an informed film that goes to great lengths to, to actually in detail explain how the, the male gaze and such patriarchal practices um, have repercussions concerning the work of, of female filmmakers, but also kind of shaping that, that social way of looking at the female body, of uh, establishing sort of power structures. Um, how, I guess my question would be, how did you go about constructing the film in such a way to, to make that understood? Well, we had, um, you know, originally put the film together just kind of the same way that my lecture had been put together. So sort of chronological, um, starting from, you know, the, the earliest uh, examples and then leading it up to the latest examples. And um, when I started working with the editor, Cecily Rett, you know, she had the strong feeling that um, that was not the most effective way to construct the film, that we should um, do it, what she called green eggs and ham. I don't know if your viewers know this Dr. Zeus book where, you know, he says, you know, even, even in a boat and even in a train and even on a mountain and even on a river. Oh, and, yeah. you know, it's sort yeah. of like, so our, our thing was like, we'll set up this, um, kind of, you know, in a way, very simple thing, like shot design, you know, camera movement, fragmentation, lighting, you know, these, these simple points that you can apply to very complicated and deep and entrenched situations. So we set up, we set up the points first, and then we start showing that, you know, it's true if you're, you know, uh, even it's it's true if you're objectified, of course, it's but it's true if you're the subject and it's true if you're an action hero, if you're a woman. And it's often true. Uh, we see it in not only women, but we've seen it in um, queer people, the way that that queer people have been represented. And at, towards the end of the film, I show it, you know, also an example uh, from a notorious racist film. Mm. Um, that where a black slave is treated the same way in terms of shot design. Yeah. So we had so we had this this basic structure that we show like look it's here and it's here and it's here and it's in the audio and it's in this it, like everywhere you look you're surrounded with this depiction of women basically as less than fully human and then we tied it in to the struggles that women have had, including, of course, me, because in, in many ways, it's my own story um, as a, you know, trying to catch a break. You get rave yeah. reviews, you're invited to film festivals, no one will talk to you. 
you know, and we found that from, from, uh, from ev almost every single woman you'll talk to has had the same experience, uh, um, at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I thought that while watching the film that, that maybe one of the most surprising to some people um, aspect of it is that, 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 that kind of ubiquitousness of the male gaze that out of a list of the 100 greatest movies of all time, that is, I don't know, if, um, well, I mean, the greatest movie of all time, that, that would be, you know, according to taste, but that um, right. of, of, of lists that are compiled maybe by, by Rotten Tomatoes, by, by sites like that, um, there would be maybe two films that do not employ such a way of perceiving the female body. Um, and I found that, yeah, that, that was, it's, that's one that's, of the, like the shocking, uh, extent it's, of that. It's, it's, it's shocking because it's sort of so accepted. And that's one of the points we make in the film as well, that it's so ingrained. It's so accepted. This is not something that only male cis male heterosexual directors do, you know, we see women directors do it too. They reproduce the same kind of language that they've been, um, you know, sort of taught either consciously or unconsciously absorbed, um, then it's, it's, it's endlessly reproduced, you yeah. know, and it, it, it's, it's very, very damaging actually. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a position. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and one of the, um, most shocking, uh, examples of, of how it can be kind of directly damaging would be, uh, the example of, of Lara Dale who, um, starred in a film uh, called High Desert Kale. And uh, basically what she was told was that if she wouldn't partake in a nude scene that, that had not been in the script beforehand, it would efficiently end her career, basically. And um, it did end her career. <laughs> yeah, it, it did. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, that, you know, I mean, that's one of a zillion examples. You know, I mean, you could you could make a 10 hour film with with women telling their stories um, yeah. about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I found that there's um, this this audio bit of her. I think it's her agent um, calling her about the repercussions of her not accepting to play or to star in that nude scene. Um, and it it is used in at two points in the film. And I felt kind of that, that the first time we hear it, we do not know the voice that it comes from. And I felt that it was almost used as a kind of warning, as a kind of yeah. way of, of saying like, this is not only, um, this is not only the fate of one woman, but this is also what could happen, for example, to you by, by showing, showing this film, this, this can happen all the time. Was that, kind of your intention by, by putting absolutely. it right at the beginning? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the other um, thing about the opening sequence is, you know, we sort of set it up. It, obviously, it's a riff on Vertigo, um, mm -hmm. the way we constructed the, the opening title. And, um, you know, the idea of, ha you know, of using like a horror, mu horror music uh, kind of type of score um, that was influenced by vertigo so to say you know this this is a horror movie you know? <laughs> yeah. this, this this is this is a horror movie yeah. and most of us have been living this horror movie for 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 all of our lives yeah yeah um <clears throat> and um i i think sort of uh based on that that horror aspect um women throughout the history of, of film um, have tried to come up with ways to, to break that ubiquitousness of, of the male gaze. And you yourself give, give examples of that from your own work, but also from uh, Celine Sciamma, for example. Um, could you maybe describe how um, the use or, or how the male gaze may be subverted? In, in the ways of, of making films? Well, I think that, you know, what I always say is that the thing that's so um, horrible about, you know, the 
the male gaze, which we're using this phrase, the male gaze to sort of refer in a, in a broad way to this uh, process of consistently objectifying the female characters. Um, the, um, the thing about it that's really interesting to me is how little imagination is included in this uh, monolithic construction. It's like, you look at all of these famous directors, you know, and we focus mainly on American films, but we, we point to a number of major directors, you know, who, who from the international world uh, claim directors as well. And they all seem to like do the exact same thing. It's like they're following, they're really following a law, mm. you know, and this is how you do it. So my thing about subverting it is like, what happens if you just listen to yourself you know, if you're not a cis male heterosexual, or even if you are, you know, what if you just listen to how you really feel? Does everyone really have, you know, their desire is on this little checklist? It's exactly like this. This is exactly how I feel about this person that, you know, that I have desire for, or I'm in love with. You know, I don't believe that. I think that everyone, if they would actually take a moment, which most of us never do, to just sort of, you know, go like, well, what am I, what am I actually experiencing? I say this, you know, in the film, what am I actually experiencing? What, what is actually, what does desire actually feel like? And how would that translate into a shot? You know, a lot of times you mm -hmm. see, you know, I mean, we have a number of super famous um, classic, uh, films by women you know that that we point to like Wanda and and um John John Dealman uh, you know these are like you know landmark films where women directors said you know it doesn't feel good to be a sexual object yeah, yeah. it's not fun yeah. it's not cool and groovy <laughs> it's crushing yeah it's yeah. crushing yeah. and you know yeah. so I think that the um, what I am sort of uh, uh, advocating for is is a return to an individual experience of self and an individual expression instead of just reproducing the same old yeah. stuff, which then circles back. As, you know, Dr. Kathleen Tarr says this in the film. You know, it's like there's this toxic stuff in the in the culture and it's energized by these films and it's amplified by these mm -hmm. films and then it infiltrates us and then we reproduce it you know so it's it just goes on and on it's this circle of violence yeah i thought that that was actually one of the biggest dangers of of uh, the male gaze as it is being used in filmmaking is not only that it is offensive in a sense in a sense yeah. but that it is also infectious that, that actually that is reproduced and used and, and so many times over that filmmakers actually have to kind of relearn their intuitive ability to, to um, um, follow their own kind of natural emotions and way of seeing as they put it on screen. Um, yeah, I think that's really, I mean, it's so challenging to even have your own way of seeing in this world, yeah. you know, because we're, 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 we're inundated with, with a very specific way of seeing. And, yeah. you know, it takes, I mean, Julie Dash talks about this in the movie. She says it takes a huge amount of courage and a huge amount of strength to not just give people as a filmmaker what they are clamoring for. Yeah, yeah. I thought that that was also beautifully put in, in um, the, the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that you have in the film, which is kind of an eye opener in which that he says that perception is not whimsical, it's fatal. So meaning that um, the way that we look at the world through a camera is not just, you know, it's not just, oh yeah, it's my way of seeing the world. That's just me or something like that. But it is... Um, yeah, it, it is crushing, as you said. It is um, a definite take on something that is actually, well, killing in a sense. Um, I, I think also, you know, if you're, if you're talking about um, women, you're talking about like this very tricky thing that I feel it's kind of tricky um, 
that I talk about in the film, which is that, you know, women are glamorized and this is a way, uh, you know, in cinema and, and women are glamorized and, and that glamor is like a veil and a cover up for the powerlessness of that position. So that's why you have, you know, billions of dollars spent on makeup and, you know, plastic surgery and all this kind of stuff for, mm. for women who feel like that's my only way to be powerful. But yeah. we know that it, it, it doesn't work, you know, yeah, it doesn't yeah. make you powerful. Yeah. <laughs> look at, look at, you know, look at all the famous uh, women who, came out at the beginning of the Me Too movement. Yeah, who, yeah. You know, we're not spared. Yeah, no, that's, that's... Rape, assault, you know, sexual... Yeah. You know, one in three women internationally is raped. Yes, and that's, and that's just the truth there. Yeah. That's... Um, I think one way that you, that you also kind of um, give um, a counterpoint to that kind of, 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 of rape culture, of, of uh, patriarchal structures is, of, is, is by, by kind of recounting the history of women specifically in, um, in filmmaking and making that, you know, something that I also didn't know much about. Um, you're, you're telling about the power of women in the early stages of the film industry, which was basically taken away by, well, male greed. Um, yeah. Could you could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yeah, well, in the during the silent era, women were very active in Hollywood and in uh, in in film in general. Also in France, you know, the famous uh, Alice Guy Blachet example that we give, the Cabbage Fairy, which is the first known narrative film, was made by a French woman. Um, and the, uh, the roles that, that women had in this early time, this early silent era were, you know, were, were very creative and very, you know, they'd be like writer, director, and producer, and, you know, like probably editor too. Um, and, but the minute that Wall Street, the sound came in and it had a huge requirement for, for finances, and then Wall Street came in. Um, the minute that that happened, the minute it was, you know, the, the forces of capital came in, women were pushed out. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of going on to the, 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 the way that it is sort of right now, I mean, there's one point in the film where you basically make that kind of distinction or, or comparison between like a 50-50 um, divide of men and women uh, at film academies while there is, I don't know, like 98% of all films being, being produced are done by, by male directors or, or have, you know, um, in, in that way. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? What, what kind of the, 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 the present holds in um, that regard? Well, you know, at the, at, the, at the present, 2022, we are st starting to see some change. And, and uh, we're starting to see a shift. We're still a million miles away from 50-50, um, but we're, we're seeing a shift. I think the most important shift that we've seen is really a global awareness of this issue. Yeah. Um, and it has affected numbers. Numbers are, are, are moving a little bit. Um, it's definitely something that's happened in the last five years. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for decades and decades and decades and decades, there was no movement. And there were people who, who fought against it, you know, through history, but um, nothing happened. Really, it was a shift in the global awareness um, that, that happened recently around, uh, well, certainly the Me Too movement, but even before that, the woman who speaks in our film, Maria Geis, who got the federal government to actually say, hey, this is illegal, yeah. you know? Perception is not whimsical, but fatal. We hire, you know, we hire whichever person we think can creatively do the job. It's like, whoops, that's yeah. illegal. The amount of discrimination, the extent of it, which was atrocious. It yeah. wasn't even like a little bit, it was like insane. Yeah. So, 
you know, they were threatened with huge fines and things started to shift. Yeah. You know, it was the, the when the pocketbook, when the money question comes up, you know, um, there was that change in the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, these things, I think, really impacted global consciousness about a problem that many of us, I'm sure you, um, and, and many of us have been aware of for decades and decades and decades, but somehow now there's a space where it can be actually considered an important discussion. I mean, it wasn't considered an important discussion. Yeah. You know, I've been talking about this stuff forever. I'm not the only yeah. one, Yeah. but yeah. who cared? Definitely. Um, one of the way that you, that you kind of tackle that, that sort of discussion and give it a, a uh, different, different ways, different colors of, of, of arguments as well, um, is, um, by, by interviewing women from in a way all, all, all walks of life. It's not just the film industry, there are scholars, there are psychologists. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about how you chose your, your interview partners? Yeah, the, the, you know, the interview process was, it's not like we had a list at the beginning and then check, 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 you know, it was, it was an organic process. You know, it started off with actually reaching out to almost all of the directors who were featured in the film. Um, and the, I'm talking about, you know, Godard and, you know, Spike Lee and Sophia Coppola and all those big names. We reached out to them and they were not interested in uh, participating in an interview. And then over time, we sort of, as the film started growing and, you know, taking shape, you know, we're like, oh my God, wouldn't it be great to have a psychoanalyst talk about the inner, the inner effect? And wouldn't it be great to have an attorney and an educator like Kathleen Tarr talk about, you know, how it's known that, you know, employment discrimination in the media industry was never enforced. And, you know, wouldn't it be great to, um, have Eliza Hitman or Julie Dash talk about their experiences, you know? Yeah. So a lot of the people who are in the film, actually, um, a, a significant portion of the people in my film are, are just my friends, yeah. um, and, and my colleagues, you know? And, um, we were excited to have Joey Soloway speak about the perspective of non-binary, what, what, you know, sh uh, they talk about um, what happens if you're, you know, you're not in the so-called male position, you're not in the female position, you know, yeah. you're in for, you're coming from it, from this, this very specific position um, of being non-binary. But I, I feel like these voices added to the understanding that this problem is is much deeper and wider than I, I don't want to say only cis women because yeah. cis women probably make up you know gazillion a percentage of of the world but but it's uh, it's an issue that all of us who are outside of this you know very sort of rigid, a space that's defined by the cis male heterosexual man. Mm -hmm. And there are many of us who are outside of it. Yeah. Um, that we need to explode that and find another way of um, making movies and creating images that speak to our own experience. I mean, this is, this is not a new idea. No, <laughs> I no. have to say, this is not a new idea. People have been talking about this for a long time, but I think that what what the film um, the film has done from what I hear from viewers is that they're they're confronted with the extent yeah. of the so-called major films, the major classics that perpetuate this language. Because most of us, you know, were aware like, oh yeah, women, you know, naked women or women in bikinis in car commercials, yeah. Or, you know, Women in bikinis in music videos. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. do you know that like at almost mm -hmm. every single Academy Award winner and almost every single con winner, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's a different kind of angle on it. Yeah, definitely. It makes it more personal. It brings it home in a, in a very real sense. 
it shows you what you would have picked as the greatest movie of all time and and shows you how much of that kind of patriarchal structure is really in there what do you what you've been watching <laughs> you know yeah um and i think also um what was also a sort of eye opener or well i think it's one of the most um one of the biggest kind of misunderstanding that many people have um, is that you can just sort of tackle that patriarchal structure by making films that are um, only empowering in content in a sense. Because you, you make examples of, of films that might be described as, as being feminist in, in, in content and the kind of story that they tell. Um, and you, you also touched on that a little earlier. Um, could you maybe elaborate how um, a film who, who might have a feminist content could also employ those patriarchal um, ways of, of perception? Yeah, I think, you know, we see that quite a lot, I'm sorry to say. You know, there are a number of films in, that we um, highlight in brainwashed. Um, one uh, example is Bombshell, um, which was uh, feminist in theme, but very interestingly, you know, the scene where we have the scene where we have the sexual harassment happening, there's only one scene, mm -hmm. um, it's shot exactly like you would expect, yeah. you know, yeah. zoom in on her underwear, pan up and down her body. Why? Yeah. So, and people, when they're watching the film, they're not going to be aware of that. They're not going to go, oh, this is, I mean, unless you're me <laughs> sitting there looking at shot design. Yeah. But most people are just going to be like, oh, you know, I like that movie. Why did it make me feel weird inside? Mm, yeah. You know, I had uh, so many uh, messages come in, like uh, just over Instagram and stuff from people I didn't know, you know, saying like, oh my God, you know, you gave me a language to, to talk about how I like would walk out of a film feeling sort of icky. I didn't really like it, mm. but I, I, I couldn't say why, yeah. you know? So there's, there's that example, or there's example by, uh, you know, a, a film, by uh, a woman director such as Hustlers, you know, yeah. which was a which had female subjects, but of, but it was you know centered on this strip club and had endless shots that reproduced this kind of language. So is you know does that undercut the message? I mean, to me, yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it basically it it um, shows you exactly what it doesn't want to show you in a sense. It it kind of takes on the perception or the viewpoint of of the oppressor of of the rapist you might might say um yeah. in that sense and that's yeah that that was kind of you know in a way an eye opening for me that that you know good intentions <laughs> in that sense need to be acted upon in in the formal structure of a film as well um yeah um okay uh nina i think that's that's it from me for now um i'd like okay. to thank you so much again for being here and for taking the time um and thank you again for your film i i think it is an incredibly important film and a film that has shown me and certainly will show many other people um the the sort of connections between the male gaze and and patriarchal power structures, and um, and and structures that 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 exist in Hollywood, but all over the world, um, and I can just say that everybody should watch it. <laughs>